about the result of our compelling topic and our A-list of hospital CEO panelists. The direction and health of our industry is vitally important to the Chicago market. There are 91 hospitals in the metro area, and they receive 21 million visits each year and contribute $25 billion annually to our regional economy. This event, along with our annual hospital trustee and physician's breakfast, are part of Crane's overall effort to provide real-time, actionable news and information about Chicago's healthcare industry. In addition to these three events, CraneChicagoHealthcare.com provides the most comprehensive coverage of your industry. And starting this week, you can read our healthcare news along with everything else from Crane's on our new iPad app. You can download it today at the Apple App Store or by going to chicagobusiness.com slash iSubscribe. I'd like to quickly acknowledge the team that is responsible for our market-leading coverage of Chicago healthcare. Reporters Kristen Schorsch and Andrew Wong and Tom Korfman, our moderator, who you will meet in just a moment. I'm also happy to introduce a special guest many of you likely know, my friend and colleague Fawn Lopez, who is publisher of Modern Healthcare, and we're also honored to have here today Alderman George Cardenas, Chairman of the Health Environment Committee for Chicago City Council. Will you please stand so we can acknowledge you? Now this hospital CEO breakfast would not be possible without the generous support of our outstanding sponsors. We're honored today to be joined by representatives from our three co-sponsors, Allscripts, Comcast Business Class, and Drinker Biddle and Wreath, as well as our presenting sponsor, Price Waterhouse Coopers. I'd like to take a moment and introduce these sponsors and give you a chance to thank them. When I say your name, please stand so everyone can see you. From all scripts, please join Seth Frank, who is Vice President of Finance. All scripts is an open technology platform which allows it to deliver the insights that healthcare providers need to generate world-class outcomes. The company does this in three ways, through its electronic health record, practice management, and other clinical revenue cycle connectivity and information solutions. As a result, Allscripts creates a connected community of health for physicians, hospital, and post-acute organizations. Next, we have Kevin Burnson, who is Senior Enterprise Sales Manager for our co-sponsor, Comcast Business Services. Comcast Business Cl Class has the tools a hospital needs to enhance its productivity. This includes a scalable internet and voice service that can be adjusted to any healthcare provider's changing needs. In addition, Comcast Business Class customizes its solutions to you. Kevin and his team would be happy to learn more about your healthcare organization's needs and talk with you about these solutions and how they are able to help your institution. From our third co-sponsor, Drinker, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath, we're happy to have Doug Swill, who is Managing Partner and Healthcare Group Chair. <laughs> Drinker Biddle's healthcare industry team serves more than 700 clients in 45 states. This makes it one of the largest national practice to represent healthcare organizations. The firm's lawyers collaborate across specialties to serve clients in every sector of the industry. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Albion from our presenting sponsor, Price Waterhouse Coopers. Joe is the national health industry provider leader, and PwC's healthcare industry practice serves all segments of the market, including providers, payers, suppliers, and employers. Its goal is to help them meet the challenges of today's changing environment. By understanding the needs and issues of each segment, as well as the complex interrelationships among these sectors, the firm is able to help its clients address issues and take advantage of strategic opportunities. PwC collaborates with major industry associations from AHIP to HFMA and is working closely with them in the transformation of healthcare. 
Joe has more than 20 years of experience with healthcare and entrepreneurial companies. He brings a national perspective and is known for creating an optimal strategy and tapping resources from across PwC to support his work. Joe specializes in operations and financial management. His extensive background in these areas include working with multinational health systems to provide maximum profits and operational efficiency. Joe's clients include hospital, health systems, and physician organizations. Before beginning his consulting career, Joe held a variety of positions in the Academic Medical Center at the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Joe to the podium to share a few thoughts. Joe? Thank you so much. I'm going to have to pay whoever wrote that. It was uh, quite nice. Thank you so much. Um, so as Dave said, my name is Joe Alvey, and I lead PwC's uh, uh, provider consulting practice nationally. And I'm born and raised Chicagoan, so I'm really happy to see so many people here braving Today's cold, coming down from highs of 70. It's wonderful here in Chicago. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, it's unbelievable to see this turnout. And thank you, Cranes, for uh, having us here. And, and certainly, I think it's going to be a great morning for us all, uh, seeing CEOs uh, like we have on the panel today. And I think it's uh, interesting, as Chicago is probably one of the more competitive marketplaces, to see CEOs like this come together and share and collaborate, particularly in today's environment, is really phenomenal. So I congratulate the, the panel. And I think we're going to probably need some of the best thinking uh, today as we get through some of the major challenges that we're all faced 25 days and counting, at least for the fiscal cliff. Uh, let's talk about that. So in Washington, you know, certainly everybody's looking at the uh, news stories. Uh, President Obama and uh, Congress still uh, focused on avoiding that cliff. Uh, but with that, I think there's a fairly significant looming uh, cloud over our industry, uh, to say the least, uh, and creates some uncertainty. Uh, but with that uncertainty, I think we all know around this table that healthcare is going to be one of those areas that the uh, Washington uh, policy makers look to trim the budget. Uh, I think the what, the where, the how that happens uh, is going to affect all of us in the room today, and we'll be you know, looking at this with uh, bated breath. Now, from a PwC standpoint, you know, we've invested pretty heavily uh, in this area looking at uh, health research. In fact, we've had a health research institute for the past seven years. We've actually begun to uh, uh, integrate our health policy analysts and research around these policy issues. And I'll tell you, although it might be stating the obvious, this is obviously a challenging time for us as providers of care. Uh, when you think about the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, certainly hospitals in the room are already facing steep cuts. Uh, physicians threatened with double-digit cuts. Uh, we'll see what Congress does there this time around. Uh, but with this fiscal cliff, we're all bracing for you know, $600 plus billion dollars of potential across the board cuts. At the same time, we're going to have 30 more million new patients coming in, certainly through uh, Medicaid coverage. Uh, millions of new patients, new cuts, certainly cuts against the Medicare program, obviously is going to create challenges for us as providers of care. Washington aside, we actually as a firm wanted to see what consumers were saying. Uh, we did an online survey recently of about 1,200 consumers, and post-election, 7 out of 10, 70 percent obviously, say to President Obama, rein in health care costs. While that may not be surprising to us, there were two of those statistics that I found quite surprising. Half of the, page, of the consumers we surveyed said, cut more on doctors and hospitals. So obviously a bit of a bullseye for us. 42%, and this is where I find it very interesting, 42% said cut information technology. All right, think about that with all the investments that we've all made in technology. And what I'd say is that the value of those investments have not been clearly communicated to our consumers. So all of our research points to we have some work to do in terms of creating and communicating that value. So part of the solution in driving value, I think we all know, and what we're all struggling with is how do you keep us all better? How do we keep us well longer and out of uh, the traditional uh, venues of care? And I think herein lies the dilemma that we're forced with, or faced with, I should say, New business models are bearing down on us pretty quickly. But how and when do you let go of those models that have served us so well and have been profitable? When do you make those changes? And how do we manage through that transition? Clearly, it's not going to be easy. And I think 
again, when I look at the sea of faces around here, it's really the out-of-box thinking and a lot of the conversations that I heard happening before the breakfast that is really going to make that change. The other piece is, frankly, convergence. And I had just a conversation a few minutes ago about the blurring lines of the traditional parties. We've talked about this for a long time. And in fact, my table mate and I were talking about the fact we've, we've talked about it for a decade now. But the traditional players coming together and really driving value, pairs and providers, some very interesting examples in this market alone of driving that change. Uh, frankly, as the provider leader, I have had more conversations with pharma and life sciences companies this past year than I had in my previous 25 years. So it's an interesting time for traditional players. But we all know, and I'm sure there's a few in the room, there's non-traditional players. I was at a dinner the other night with a, a number of players across the continuum, including some major retailers. So we're talking about everybody getting in this game and potentially disrupting our traditional business models. So looming financial pressures, increasing consumer empowerment, and certainly convergence, I think is going to make an interesting time for all of us uh, that serve the provider community. And I know we all want to hear from the panel around how we're facing these challenges. So again, thank you so much, David. I think I'm going to bring it back to you. But thanks again, and we appreciate uh, the opportunity today. Thanks. Joe, thank you very much. Now, I know you're all eager to dig into this morning's topic, which includes how the results of the federal elections will affect the healthcare industry in general and our market in particular. Our moderator, Tom Korfman, is the right man to lead this discussion. Tom is assistant managing editor for Cranes. He directs our expanded healthcare coverage in print and online. He was also the driving force behind the creation of Chicago Health, uh, Real Estate Daily.com, which is the leading source of news and information for the region's commercial and residential real estate industry. Before his career as a journalist at Cranes in the Chicago Tribune, Tom spent seven years as a practicing attorney. So I now hand things over to Tom Korfman to begin this morning's discussion. Tom? Thank you, David. Um, I am a former lawyer, and so it is my duty to advise the panel that they have now uh, surrendered their right to remain silent. <laughs> uh, during the course of the registration process, uh, we asked people to submit questions. Uh, some of those uh, that we will, uh, I will touch on in my discussion with the panelists, and then uh, toward the end of our time, uh, we will go through those as quickly as we can. Um, the questions were a very interesting group. Uh, we also got uh, three requests for pay raises, two requests for promotions, and one request for a day off next Friday. <laughs> David, I'll show you that request uh, <laughs> after we're done. Uh, so uh, at the bottom of the hour, at 9.30, we will go to questions from the audience, just so you can start thinking then. We will have two microphones uh, at each end of the room. You people in the middle may have to shout, uh, but I want you to know just roughly the time, uh, the time frame that we're dealing with. Uh, gentlemen, uh, let's begin uh, with the fiscal cliff. House Republicans on Monday proposed $600 billion in cuts to Medicare and other pro health programs over 10 years, compared with $350 billion the President has proposed. Those cuts would come on top of $716 billion in reduced payments to health care providers uh, that are part of the uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, one of our guests, Larry Ryan from Intersect Health Information Technology, asks, do you see the greatest cha changes coming from the Affordable Care Act or from deficit reduction initiatives? And uh, David, I will start with you. Which do you think is the worst, is the biggest challenge to your business? Well, I think they're both challenging in the sense that they're going to require us to change the way we deliver care. Uh, I was interested by the results of the poll where people aren't sure they understand the value proposition of what we provide. And I think it's incumbent upon us to do a better job of articulating that and providing that. And that will mean that we'll need to reorganize the way we provide care. With these large cuts, whether it's the fiscal cliff cuts or the way that we're getting paid differently under health care reform, it's incumbent upon us to restructure the way we provide care. And it's a very fragmented delivery system right now. We're going to have to work much more closely with our physician providers and others 
in managing the delivery of care. And one of the things that I think is missing in the healthcare reform package is really this concept of access, especially to physician providers. We've really been unclear about the economics of how patients will gain more access to physicians. That's something we're gonna to have to work on even more hard in the future. Uh, uh, Mark Neiman from uh, North Shore, do you think, uh, David's uh, answer seemed to be kind of both. Uh, which do you think is gonna be the biggest challenge, deficit reduction or the Affordable Care Act? I would agree with uh, David how he dodged the question to begin with, but uh, <laughs> I'd also add that the, uh, the commercial marketplace is another force out here. I think they're both equally powerful. And if I could, I'd like to just take a step back and have us uh, put in the back of our minds a different thought. How can the federal government arbitrarily and capriciously cut what hospitals and doctors get paid? It's one of the unique aspects of the American economy where the price for goods and services is set by the federal government, not by the marketplace. And the consistent battle that we've always fought on the provider side is what is gonna be the level of cut, it's not if there are gonna be more cuts, it's how big of the cut, and then what do we need to do to respond to those cuts? Part of the answer is, as David adequately, very eloquently described, it's change the practice of medicine, get better, get more efficient, all the kinds of things that uh, we really should do but there's another question out there that the political system is beginning to ask, and that is, is there a better way to pay for Medicare to begin with? And whether you think about, if you're Republican, you call it vouchers, and if you're Democrat, you call it subsidies, and if you're an independent, you call it premium support, but the notion is changing the underlying financing of Medicare, and I think that's another element, Tom, that's gonna have to come out in this debate in the days ahead. Do you, but do you think, uh, Mark, that the, is, it, is it a problem of, uh, is it partly a problem of the perception of the value that hospitals, for example, provide? Because, uh, um, you know, most people think we spend way too much on health care and don't get uh, a, 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 a quality product in return. I think clearly it is part of our, it is part of our fault that we have not adequately communicated the value except to the people that use our services. The um, uh, Rick Floyd from Sherman Health, I want to ask you, I remember that, uh, you know, there I think was an old uh, uh, boxer used to say, six months in the hospital or death. W which, is the, which is the worst, which is the biggest challenge to the healthcare industry? Is it, a, is it Accountable Care uh, Act or is it deficit reduction? You know, Tom, you're asking us all to sort of look in the crystal ball and so that truth, the honest answer to your question is nobody really knows, but they'll both have major impacts. And we all recognize, as you say, that America has to improve healthcare value. And we anticipate, we see a future where uh, payment rates to hospitals will be cut dramatically, utilization rates of hospital services, doctor service, outpatient services will all decline rapidly. And that will force us to significantly reduce our cost structure. Well, the, the bigger wild card right now might be deficit reduction because we have had several years to kind of prepare for the changes in, uh, 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 under the health care overhaul. We're suddenly in this kind of free fall situation where we don't quite know how uh, the cuts are going to play out. Uh, the, um, uh, will, um, will the... Uh, Will the challenge there, uh, we all recognize that, I guess, to some extent, that the costs have to be reduced. But uh, is the challenge particularly, you know, so much of a dominant, the dominant uh, uh, aspect of the, of the health care market is the public programs, Medicare and Medicaid. Alan Channing, what's your take on what the, 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 the challenges will be going forward now? Will you see more changes because of the Affordable Care Act, or will we see dramatic and swift changes because of uh, deficit reduction? Well, I've been impressed, again, that my colleagues have all sort of moved around this, uh, this answer pretty well. Uh, you know, Sinai is in kind of a unique position uh, with respect to the federal government because most of our services are supported by Medicaid. So we're really concerned about what's happening in that place downstate, what's it called, Springfield? <laughs> um, and, and so we're concerned about that, but just to, to focus for a second, you know, I, the way I've thought about this is sort of short-term, long-term implications. The short-term implications, what's happening in the next two weeks in Washington and, and what 
the, the two parties are gonna end up doing, working with the, the president, coming together there. It's pretty clear there will be more short-term reductions in Medicare. It's gonna impact on our physicians, it's gonna impact on our hospitals, it's gonna impact on our training programs, teaching future physicians across the board. Why is that taking place? And you've sort of raised that question a minute ago, Tom. It's because the system was designed to deliver care the way we're delivering care, or no system. It sort of all came together today. I think what we're being challenged on the longer term now, going back to the ACA question, is how can we rethink it collectively to be able to deliver care in a different model that makes more sense doesn't drive the economics off the table, and patients and populations get healthier. The, uh, now, Mark, you mentioned about the changes to Medicare and, uh, and unilateral changes, but the, the, the problem is that it, it is, this is a, a, an industry that has not had a, a lot of competition for patients, not a lot of competition on price, right? I mean, that has been the... And now, I think what we're seeing is this you know, the, the industry is now seeing an entirely different, which, you know, many people in this business know uh, in the room here who aren't working for hospitals are very familiar with price competition. They feel, like, feel it all the time. Now what we're seeing is th this the, uh, desire to put more price competition on hospitals, yes? Yes, you're absolutely correct. And I think there's an additional element that we ought to again think about, and that is there's price competition being forced by Washington or Springfield but is there a price sensitivity ultimately out there by the users of the service? And that has also generally been lacking, that people are generally price, un, they're not sensitive to price uh, themselves. One of the dysfunctions is the fact that, you know, in a way it's a kind of a system that where nobody really kind of pays for it, but we all pay for it. Agree 100%. But do you think that, the, for example, whether you call it a, a voucher system or high deductibles, many employers are going to high deductible systems, does that, will that really, help in terms of reducing costs? Do you, think, do you think patients, your patients come into one of your four hospitals, are, you know, do they, are they willy-nilly ordering up uh, tests because, they, because it's fun to go through an MRI? At North Shore, yes it is. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I, but what, what, what I think we're really beginning to see is the foothills of this prophecy coming into play. And that is people that have come up with, you know, five, ten thousand uh, dollar kinds of plans. Uh, they're really sensitive out of pocket to those, uh, to those numbers. So I think we're beginning to see price competition and price sensitivity even at the consumer level. Because in some sense, when I go, when I have a loved one who needs medical care, right, I don't, I don't want the budget plan, right? I want you know, in, in one way, I want every test possible. I mean, David, you, there's this sense, you know, that both, and doctors, of course, are more importantly, they're, uh, uh, they are incented, and hospitals as well, to provide more service rather than less. I, I think that's true, and I think we, providers uh, and hospitals and physicians, want to make sure we take care of the needs of the patient. And that's a very unique, very customized encounter that takes place. But Mark is right, the, the individual consumers at this point have been protected from the value question of what am I getting for what I'm paying, because for most of us in this room, our insurance is provided by an employer. It's not a price sensitive issue where that question about the MRI is asked for by the patient. They're not saying, is this really worth it? Uh, we, we haven't reached the tipping point in the but industry. Let me just ask on that though, though. On the other hand, and you know, uh, if a doctor says to me, Tom, we could do this, but it's really not gonna affect what I'm gonna do. It's not gonna really help us decide what your uh, care should be. Or, or more difficultly, right, it is not really gonna extend your life. Is there a lot of pushback from patients? Or, or do patients, if they trust their doctor, do they uh, appreciate that judgment? Because I'll tell you that, you know, uh, you know, I don't know a lot of people who actually like going to the doctor. I mean, I suppose, you know, I know we, here on the, on the panel, we probably love those people. But most people would, you know, 
put it off to the last possible moment, right? I mean, is there, is there a sense that, you know, do we need doctors to be, because, and if we change the financial incentives, will doctors be less inclined to do more? It's a complicated question. Right now, physicians are, in, are careful to practice defensively. Uh, and so that is another cloud that lies over this decision of healthcare consumption. Physicians, when they are at risk personally, are, are gonna have a tendency to be defensive and, and perhaps play it safe and, and over-prescribe uh, for diagnostic procedures. That's a reality of healthcare that no one has dealt with yet, this issue of, of protecting tort uh, limits on, on practitioners. So that's another factor that impacts the decision that's provided to a patient. Here's your choice of tests you need to take. Which way do you want to go? I recommend this. That's got to be flavored by a, a physician saying, I've got to protect my own liability here. The, uh, there was a lot of interest uh, among our uh, guests in what uh, each of you are doing to prepare for this long list of changes that are being imposed on the industry by the uh, Accountable, uh, Affordable Care Act. So uh, Rick, can you just pick one uh, of the several things that are gonna happen in the next four or five years and just talk about how Sherman is preparing for that change? Pick your best, pick your best topic. Well, the the largest piece of that, Tom, is our expectation that we are moving towards the world of population management. And we sort of touched on it uh, sort of tangentially so far. But we think in order for America to live within its means that we must find a way to change the incentives and uh, to reward health promotion rather than just waiting until people get sick and show up on our doorsteps. That dynamic tends to result in what they've described is this sort of tendency uh, to, to do stuff. And some of it is, is warranted. But how, how are, you, are you ready for, the, for that? Because uh, that's a big shift in terms of the economics of your business. Yes? Absolutely. It's, it's a sea change, not just the economics, but everything else as well. And that is the reason Sherman, after 125 years of independence, uh, decided it was time to become part of something larger and to consider uh, the, the infrastructure needs of that kind of world. Because uh, we felt a freestanding community hospital was poorly structured to play the population management. To game. handle those, that change in pricing. Not, well, not just the pricing well, piece, but it, I mean- And just the delivery of, of care, it's yeah, both, right? Think, think of the need to deliver better quality outcomes at lower costs. You, you know, you, you're not going to be able to do that as effectively as a freestanding community hospital as you are as part of a larger system that has the IT infrastructure, the physician infrastructure, and uh, the other elements that are required for that, for that new world. Mark, what is North Shore doing to prepare for the, uh, for the changes in health care? Uh, two things, per, picking up on what Rick uh, ended with. The first thing is alignment. You know, for too many centuries we've had in the American healthcare system this this divisiveness between primary care physicians, specialty physicians, hospitals. So first of all, at North Shore, it's the alignment. Uh, in addition to our four hospitals, we have an 800 physician plus multi-specialty group of practice that is a part, is owned by the organization. And the second element of really getting that all aligned is to use powerful data analytics. Uh, 10 years ago, North Shore implemented an entire electronic medical record system across all of our hospitals, 100 plus uh, ambulatory offices. And we're just beginning to see the power of that tool in the same way that many other industries represented in this room have used for big data and data analytics. It's the tool to help you to know your customers, so to, to speak. To not only to know your customers, know what works medically. You've got to change the practice method. Was this tool efficacious or not? Well, there's a shocking lack of standards in the profession. I mean, depending on which hospital you go to, really, there's uh, just in terms of different tests, Different, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's frankly, shocking to me. It's frankly worse than that. I don't, I don't mean to shock you. I mean, it's, it's frankly worse than that. If you look at the- I'm hard to shock. <laughs> yes, I, I think it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to imagine that some of us have seen the variability with a group of 10 doctors doing the same thing, the individuality in those practice patterns uh, defy the imagination. So again, it's a tool to use data analytics to change the practice of medicine in a positive, uh, positive, medical, uh, a medical sort of way. The, uh, 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 Dave mentioned population management, uh, and uh, one of the biggest changes there is, is in term, is particularly is gonna apply in, uh, to Medicaid uh, uh, patients. Alan, 
uh, with this big shift from a fee-for-service model, where the fees were kind of below most providers' cost, how is Sinai preparing uh, to adjust to this new paradigm for the, for the industry? Well, as soon as you said Medicaid, I knew it was going to be my turn to I talk. Know. <laughs> uh, so I was afraid thanks. you were nodding off yeah, down there. Right. So. Yeah, all this talk about you know, high-tech stuff is way beyond us. But so to get back to the point, we have paid a lot of attention to population health. And we've been doing it for a number of years. So sort of who knew that on the west side of Chicago we'd be prescient enough to understand what healthcare was going to look like, healthcare reform was going to look like in 2014. So what we've done is created a program that we've described as pre-primary care. You know, my colleagues have talked about what I think to be is pretty much the traditional model of delivering care that's physician dependent. You get sick, you go see the doctor. And we believe firmly that everybody should have a, a medical home and a primary care physician. But we also think if we're gonna change the cost structure, and the language everybody is using is bending the cost curve, we're gonna get in line before the primary care physician and help people in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in their communities, understanding what the disease process is that's affecting them, particularly chronic diseases, diabetes, asthma, congestive heart failure, all the things that we think about that really keep people in the hospital and end up spending huge amounts of money, dialysis, limb amputation, worst case. So try and get way ahead of that stuff by using people who are from the community, educated about the disease process, and intervene in somebody's home. But how do you pay for uh, pre-primary care? Well, right now, we're doing it on, frankly, the, the uh, I lost the word, but on, on the, the, the grants, people supporting it. But we see, moving to 2014, as we start to look at some type of capitated per member per month payment, that if we can build this structure and work with an insurer who can manage the insurance elements of this, and we get paid a fee for keeping people healthy or providing all their care, and can really load up the, the activity on the front end, we're gonna save significant money downstream. And I can give you a very precise example of this. In our asthma program, where we've seen thousands of patients already, for every dollar we've invested in one of our community health workers, we've avoided spending up to $15 in acute care services. Now at the moment, somebody other than Sinai is benefiting from that rate of return, which is frankly pretty impressive. But we expect in 2014, we'll be able to take advantage of that, have a means to support this new model of delivering care and managing a population. So it, 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 it uh it is a, a method that uh, uh, could be, as, we, as the industry moves toward uh, more of a managed care model where you're not paid for the particular service, but more toward managing the population of, of your patient base, that is a, that is a, that, that is a, a delivery model that, that works with that, that could work with that. Absolutely. Every, right. every hospital, not just a hospital that is focused on Medicaid, Every hospital could adapt that. Yes. Uh, Dave, what is uh, Adventist Health uh, doing to prepare for just one of the changes? Pick your favorite one uh, for uh, the Ac Accountable Care Act. Well, like North Shore, we're fortunate that we've been able to invest heavily in technology, and it protects patients every day in our hospitals. We're part of a national $7 billion organization, so Electronic medical records are now in our primary care practices. We have over 200 employed physicians that are part of our integrated system, over 700 that are part of our PHO. We have a full electronic medical record in our hospitals, but the patient benefit, it's all around protecting patient safety. Uh, computerized provider order entry is a perfect example of that. That scratch of a pen 
by a physician when a, an order is written can be misinterpreted. We've eliminated that in our hospitals because it's all directly input by the physician so that that ambiguity about an order is now taken out. The longitudinal patient record that allows us to manage a patient's life from the time that they've contacted us throughout every encounter is also present in an electronic medical record. So we've invested well over $35 million in technology as we see the need to coordinate care better. At this point, I'm really impressed with what Mount Sinai has done in terms of the pre-primary aspects of that. That part of of the continuum of care is something that we still need to work on, but I'm really excited about leveraging technology to protect patients and to reduce the variation in care that exists today by providing all of our providers with evidence-based practices that are right there part of the medical record. In our system, every diagnosis pops up with an evidence-based care management module that lets the physician have tools that provide input to how they would provide care for those patients. Those are all coming alongside an efficiency of care that r eliminates waste in our system. The uh, Paul Smith from Plant Moran, uh, when he was registering, he asked, uh, do you feel like the industry has uh, enough understanding of the cost to provide services to enter into uh, bundled, pa uh, pay uh, bundled payment and revenue sharing type arrangements? Uh, bundled payments, uh, something that will kick in with Medicare, uh, we're increasingly seeing uh, both with Medicare and then commercial kind of, uh, uh, accountable care organizations this uh, uh, new style. Do you have enough? Is this, do you, do you, now, you, uh, Adventist, because of the early investment, has enough information to, to, to make a fair bargain on that? I think the complexity of population management is, is uh, not just technology. We certainly have the technology in place. What we're all experimenting with is really this concept of managing risk. For that, you need large populations, and you need to be able to define the populations very carefully. So those encounters happen in a broad spectrum of places, in physician practices, in urgent care settings, in Walgreens, uh, in, in any number of places. And so to ask hospitals to be responsible for that entire continuum of risk is something that we have yet to get good at because we don't control the entire continuum of delivery. That's the problem with the ACO party that the federal government threw a couple of years ago. This concept of attribution of risk was not clearly defined, and that's why it's not going as well as I think the federal government would like it to be. Rick, are you in the risk, risk management business? Not yet, but we need to get there. And you asked earlier, David, the question, you know, are we ready as an industry? And I would say, most players are not ready yet, have the sort of granular cost information together with the detailed quality and, and health history information by patient that would allow you to promote health and keep people healthy. So we've got a long way to go, in my opinion, as an industry, certainly at Sherman we do. The uh, healthcare reform is gonna see a dramatic increase in the number of customers. Uh, you know, as many as 1.2 million people in uh, the Chicago area will have some form of health coverage by 2014. Mark, do you see an, an opportunity there to extend care for North Shore? I think so. We're, we serve a very diverse uh, marketplace, actually, between uh, the, uh, city, the city line and up to Wisconsin, and uh, there's lots of needs out there. So I think having more people uh, have some form of insurance is uh, a good opportunity for everyone. The uh, more of these newly insured uh, uh, will be uh, in the suburbs than in the city, according to a study by uh, health and disability advocates. Uh, uh, I think roughly also, uh, I think uh, Medicaid uh, will uh, uh, be, uh, I think, uh, less than about a third of this 1.2 million, they must estimate. But isn't the challenge to provide uh, care to those uh, medi new Medicaid recipients at the current reimbursement rates? Well, you're absolutely correct. I think the, a couple of challenges. One is that the, the rates are so low that it's very, very difficult to be uh, uh, financially sustainable. I think the bigger question or the bigger risk that we see relates to physicians. In our marketplace, I'm not sure if the other, the other folks, uh, almost no physicians take Medicaid assignment, and it's really, really tough 
to get uh, patients in to see physicians. Our practice group does and part of our academic commitment and certainly Alan's uh, folks do. But to try to find a physician who was willing to take Medicaid is a tough deal and not going to get any easier uh, when they expand the Medicaid capabilities. Anybody else on the panel here see an opportunity in this dramatic expansion uh, of uh, insured patients? And, and how do you capitalize on that? From, from Sinai's perspective, and it's sort of unique, it may be even thought about as kind of the other side of the coin that, that uh, Mark is describing. Today, 15% of the patients Sinai cares for are uninsured. I expect that number to drop to 5% because of the coverage. So we have an opportunity at least to get paid, albeit it's below cost, but, but paid for the services we're providing. Do you think with this expansion of Medicaid that the, uh, the uh, bigger systems uh, like Adventist and North Shore or Advocate will uh, think about a way to uh, uh, try to attract these Medicaid patients? Or will Medicaid patients, despite the expansion, still remain kind of the, uh, the uh, uh, shunned by the system? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'd like to hear these guys answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mark, Chief. you said that the doctors, yeah, very reluctant to get the doctors outside of your own uh, practice group right. to take Medicaid patients. Uh, Impossible. My best guess is what's going to evolve, and it'll take some time, as we move from sort of fee-for-service to population management, at some point you hit, you hit that tipping point then it becomes the volume question is how many people do you take care of, not how many things do you do. I personally think we're a long ways from getting there, but that's the direction. And then you, you'll want to take every possible customer you can get into your panel. Dave, what about the, uh, you know, we've talked about the Medicaid portion of the expansion, but uh, the health reform is going to dramatically increase commercial insurance uh, for uh, uh, patients. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Alan mentioned about how large number of the, his patients are uninsured. That is something that every hospital has to work with. Is there a way for Adventist or any hospital to take advantage of this increase in, in commercially insured patients? Well, the, the soundbite of health care reform is that there will be less uninsured, and that is technically true. What none of us know is, is what that pricing structure will be like as we expand an already tax delivery system in the Medicaid and in the governmentally reimbursed sector with all this influx of new people. So uh, we, we're not sure where on the financial equation this will fall. The social contract that all hospitals have is, is to provide care for, for patients regardless of their ability to pay. But we do that by cost shifting. All of us do this from the commercial sector. The commercial sector pays for the under-reimbursed Medicaid and federally reimbursed entities. That balance between commercial and governmentally reimbursed that pays us below our cost is going to be changing. And I don't think any of us know how that math is going to turn out yet because we don't know what equilibrium this future more transparent pricing world is going to look like. Uh, Rick, uh, the state has picked the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Blue Advantage plan as the benchmark for insurance offered through the health in insurance exchange. I mean, that's a pretty favorable plan, uh, plan to, to providers uh, in terms of reimbursement rates now, right? Well, that defined the coverage. I'm not sure it's going to tell us what we're going to get paid. And I think that Dave's absolutely right that, uh, you know, the payment rates are going to be less, Tom. And so the, I don't know a, a CEO anywhere who isn't targeting cost reductions, you know, less than $30 million per site. I mean, it's, it's going to be a huge challenge. So the way we have to prepare is to, you know, to try to find ways to cut costs. And that's why you see so much uh, aggregation activity, because economies of scale do matter. And are one way to cut costs while preserving quality and access. So uh, it's, it's a long way to go. And, and I, I think that you know, making this shift from where we are to where we need to be, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a little, little friction on the road, I'm afraid. The, the, you know, the, I think, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, panelists, but, you know, the rough rule of thumb for the uh, industry is that, uh, uh, you know, Medicaid uh, uh, below your cost to provide, uh, private insurance uh, above your cost to provide, and, and Medicare somewhere in the middle. Uh, uh, the prospect is, of course, there's enormous pressure on Medicare to cut 
uh, as we're seeing from the budget talks uh, and, and earlier from the health care reform, enormous pressure for Medicare to cut its reimbursement rates. Does that threaten to kind of shake up the whole, is, that, is it Medicare that's really going to drive this cost uh, cutting more than anything else? I'll take a go ahead. Take your time. Certainly, don't, Medicare. Don't, don't, don't fight with each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Medicare is a big dog, so obviously everybody's going to follow that. And one of the challenges we all face is to live within Medicare, and there are not that many organizations that can actually break even or even ideally make money on Medicare. So, in, in the the world you just described, Tom, where commercial insurance was better, that's going away. <laughs> you know, that's not going to be around for much longer because. Uh, in, in our marketplace, you see rates converging on the Medicare rate with Medi Medicaid being below that. So it's, it's likely to become one uniform low rate, and the challenge to the healthcare provider community is to provide better quality outcomes while preserving or enhancing access and doing it all for less. Um, yeah. Me. It, it, tying, trying to tie two things together, something you asked about early on, and that's the patient demand for services and now the cost cutting. You know, where do those two lines come together? So what we're all describing in terms of cost containment is wringing out overhead, taking away costs that aren't directly related to the patient services because we're still getting that demand from the next patient who walks in to get everything that we have available to help them. And that's a reasonable, it's a reasonable request today on their part. And we're trying to figure out how to sustain the service level at the same time getting the cost down, ring out the overhead, and change the way the delivery system works. Mark, you wanted to chime in on this. I just want to note that you know Medicare, roughly 20% of all healthcare spending in this country. So how, you know, how is this going to it upset the apple cart. Uh, order magnitude or directionally, uh, we think at North Shore we need to improve our costs by about 20 percent just by the impact of what the Medicare cuts are. And that's a big change. As uh, Alan talked about, we know we need to be efficient on the back office. I really think for uh, North Shore, for all of us ultimately, it's not about just whacking your back office cost. It's about changing the practice of medicine doing it in a different way that proves that what you do each step along the way brings value into the equation. And that frankly, some of the things we've done for a long time, we only do it because we've always done it that way. It does not produce value. And so one of the good things that comes out of the, the changes that are environment is that it's gonna force us as a society and as healthcare providers to do a demonstrably better job in how we provide care. We're gonna to have to break the model if we're gonna survive financially. The, uh, uh, one of the kind of most noteworthy changes uh, uh, on, uh, as a part of health care reform that uh, address both cost and uh, uh, quality of care is the uh, penalties on readmission rates. Um, it affects, uh, to some extent, it trims a little bit from your Medicare reimbursements, uh, some more than others. Uh, um, Everybody at this panel is facing some kind of a, of a trim. Uh, Rick, uh, I think according to the Kaiser Health rundown for Illinois hospitals, Sherman uh, is uh, facing a, a penalty of uh, 0.6 tenths of a percent. What are you doing to address this readmission rate uh, question? You know, the... Um challenge that we face is to sort of evolve towards what Alan was describing, just to get out in front. And most of us have been working on reducing readmissions now for a couple of years. And the good news is, for example, he mentioned some of the chronic disease populations. With, take CHF, for example. We have a clinic, and for those patients who participate in our heart failure clinic, uh, fewer than 1% of them are readmitted within 30 days. So there are proven tactics, and uh, in, in, uh, of course the statistic that we all get measured on takes into account readmissions for all causes. So then you have to start looking at the other reasons that people are readmitted. But uh, you know, we are addressing it uh, primarily via the chronic population because most of those readmissions, most of that cost is coming from the, uh, the chronically ill. And as a, uh, although it's, uh, it's, it, it varies by system in terms of how important uh, uh, Medicare is uh, to your revenues. Um, 
uh, uh, Dave, on the readmission rate, you have a, your hospitals kind of arranged from, I think, Bolingbrook at 1% to uh, Hinsdale at 22%. You know, uh, what can you do to address that? I'm not sure we've succeeded with a 1% readmission rate at Bolingbrook, but I, uh, that's the danger in statistics. Uh, the, the penalties vary by hospital. What we're doing is working very closely with, with our home care agency. We're very fortunate that we have a, an expansive home care organization that really provides the support for patients in that post-acute environment that, that helps them uh, extend the, their wellness. I think, again, the soundbite of health care reform for readmissions is that people just come right back because the provision of care in the first round wasn't adequate. But, but if you were to look in the face of, of the, the typical 30-day readmission okay. patient, yeah. it's an 89-year-old patient that's got a list of a dozen comorbidities, and they may come back for any number of things. And so it makes us much more responsible for a much more extensive array of post-acute care than what we treated them for for that 30-day period after they leave our hospitals. Uh, and we, we're very incentive to do that, and every hospital in Chicago is very focused on that today. The, uh, uh, Mark, uh, you know, uh, although we all might agree on the need to improve care, is this just a wacky way to go about it? Uh, in a commentary in uh, Modern Healthcare published in August, you just referred to a, a short study that you did of 2,000 Medicare patients in your uh, system with uh, congestive heart failure. And, you know, I'll just, average age was 84. Uh, the average, uh, each of them were on 10 medications. Uh, they typically had multiple diagnosis, uh, multiple diagnoses, and they also had little or no functional family support. It, it, you are a critic of this readmission rate uh, formula. Why? I, I think it first of all begins with the, uh, the analysis, and our industry is so much lack the data. For the first time, we have the data analytics to basically understand why the patients are being readmitted in the first place. And the point of that study that we published was just to say, hey, these people are really sick. These people have five principal diagnoses and on 10 medications. These are really sick. But the other thing that the data pointed out is that where we typically lose it is in the handoff. As Dave was talking about, it's the referral to the nursing home, the home care company, and then it bounces back. And so what I think we've got to do is think from a systemic way of uh, improving the quality and the cost by using the data to transfer the practice of medicine. Uh, uh, Alan, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the North Shore brief study, though, pointed to the lack of, of uh, family support uh, as uh, a factor in readmission rates. Uh, it, you might say, well, you know, uh, welcome to my world. Um, do this, does this readmission data, uh, is it unfair on the, on the community hospitals? Is it too harsh, given the social issues that all their, that your, your patients have to deal with? Well, let me, let me frame it in a slightly different way, that we're still committed to doing the right thing for the right patient at the right time in the right place. So we want to make sure that that happens. And our clinical quality scores is against the current federal measures are in the top decile in the country. So we're doing all the right things that you're supposed to do. So now when the patient gets discharged, the question is, in a challenged community, are the resources there to support them? Is there a, um, a home health agency that will take a Medicaid patient? Well, that's questionable. There are fortunately a couple will do that, but they have to have something on the other side to do the cost shifting that David described earlier. You know, is there a family resource? Well, maybe not. So again, going back to our pre-primary care model, having a healthcare worker who's practicing in the community who can be supportive operating in that individual's home is a way to try and affect that, along with all the other supports that one might build around them. Uh, we will go to questions from the audience at the bottom of the hour, but now, uh, gentlemen, we are moving to the lightning round. <laughs> this is a series of questions that our guests have submitted while they were registering. Each correct answer is worth five points. Each, <laughs> each wrong answer, uh, we will take five points away. Alan is thinking, is he really going to keep score? 
And David's thinking, I can do that. <laughs> our, first, our first question comes from someone with Kane Brothers, the investment banking firm. In what circumstances would your system look for taxable financing instead of tax-exempt capital? Who wants to answer? When the rates are more attractive. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Perfect. That was easy. You will see a, you you will begin to see a trend between the questioner and the question. <laughs> Our next question is: In 2013, what new channels or types of advertising are you looking to enter this year? That's for someone from Michael Walters Advertising. <laughs> as much pro bono as we can get. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> don't, look, don't look at us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you guys have it easy compared to my publisher. You know? <laughs> Do you have a, mobile, a mobility strategy using technology to improve patient care and employee productivity? That's a question from someone with Verizon Wireless. <laughs> There is a theme here, you're right. Yes. Yeah. I, I, can, go with, I yes. can go with a halfway serious answer on that one. The no. answer is uh, absolutely yes. Uh, as you think about our system with uh, four hospitals, 100 ambulatory care centers, home care centers, it's all on a wireless platform and it transforms. I mean, the, the staff love it. It's safer, it's better. It is definitely the way to go. Thank you for uh, wireless technology. Is, it, is there any advantage to moving to uh, a smartphone as opposed to uh, just simply being a wireless, not having to deal with plugging into the network? Our physicians in the practice group have uh, iPads or iPhones and, and smartphones uh, kinds of things. Have they, have they subscribed to the Cranes app yet? <laughs> yes, they have. Yes. yes, they have. Very good. Thank you. Bless you. Uh, Rick, what do you think about mobile technology? Is it useful or... or, or I mean, and how mobile do you need to be? Pretty darn mobile. I mean, it's what the population is demanding. We also have wireless capabilities. Doctors are demanding it. They want to be able to round efficiently. The challenge, of course, is security, because you give people access to all that PHI, you better be sure it's well protected. So uh, you know, that's been the, the challenge so far. But uh, the demand is going to be unrelenting, and we're all going to have to be in that arena. Uh, where do you, uh, how, how and where do you foresee video and unified communications affecting or improving efficiencies? This is from someone with an AV company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can take ahead. a, get a uh, uh, shot at that. I think there's uh, two, at least two arenas where we're working on this. One is in providing consultations. Patients in the hospital needs a cardiac consultation. Uh, can you do that in part with the technology that is there from mobile or from a distance? And the technology is actually getting there where you can do it and have that kind of consultation within the, within the institution in a way that is much, uh, much quicker, much faster, and every bit as good. The other is uh, an area where, in working with uh, our colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, we're really trying to develop the art of doing virtual consultations by combining the work on our electronic medical record systems, bringing that together with video, and again, the technology is getting so much better. I think we can see that, uh, that end in sight. Do I want to Skype my doctor? I don't know, do you? No, I don't think I do. I don't think I do. I think the risk that we run, and maybe what you're getting at, is that we, we run the risk of breaking down a fundamental of the provision of health care, and that's a personal relationship, somebody you can trust. Well, and particularly if the system is going to increasingly rely on, let's say, a more, a, a, a more realistic uh, appreciation of what services need to be delivered, I'm not sure that that relationship can, you know, it's already impossible to get hold of your doctor, except for you except right. for these guys. Right. The rest of us, you know, it's, it's a challenge, right? I mean, it's just, that's one of the hardest parts about being a patient, yeah. is trying to talk to somebody other than a nurse. No, I, I just disagree with you. I think you that, think uh, I, think it's, I think it's evolving, and if you look at every other industry, banking, airlines, whatever industry are, everybody's online, and particularly the, kind of the younger generation in particular, that's how they live their life. At North Shore, we have 200,000 patients online on North Shore Connect. They schedule their appointments online. 
They renew their prescriptions online. They have e-chats with their uh, physicians, and they think it's grand. So I think part of what we've got to do is respond in a way that our customers are looking to be dealt with. I think there's another, yeah, go another ahead. element to that, and that's you know, the distribution of resources geographically and using technology to communicate between patients in scarce clinical resources, physician or otherwise, is going to be a real advantage. Put yourself in a critical access hospital downstate who needs a specialist mm -hmm. that could be at any one of our hospitals. And that specialist isn't going to get in the car and drive down there to see one patient or two patients. But the opportunity to use technology to make that connection it, it changes the dynamic and gets the resources to where they're necessary. Uh, someone from Apex System asks, how are you preparing to comply with ICD-10? I don't know what Apex does, but I have a guess. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take that ICD-10? I loved, I loved ICD-9. <laughs> well, this is a, a huge change in how we code the work we get done, both physicians and hospitals. It's like adding six more digits in terms of definition to what we do. Uh, Adventist Midwest Health, as part of Adventist Health System, is very focused on this. It's, it's a huge educational curve for our medical staff and for the people who code the care we provide within our hospitals. Building the technology platform is the first step for us. That's behind us. Now it's a matter of getting people ready for a total difference in how they document what they do. Uh, somebody from the UFC asks about whether or not the changes under the Affordable Care Act are going to reduce individualized care for patients. Are we going to, and this kind of touches on uh, uh, a little bit what Mark said about the technology, but uh, are we going to, are, are we going to, is it going to be more difficult with this, with population management for me to get the kind of individualized care, you know, that I don't think I get now? <laughs> Right? I mean, that's, yeah, but but that's yes, specific to you, Tom. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> you, you know, I'm old enough to remember Marshall McLuhan and high-tech, high high-touch, which came out of some of his writings. And I think that's, again, what we're talking about, is that people still are looking for the opportunity to connect. Now, whether they connect face-to-face -face or they connect in another mechanism, that still has to be there. Uh, we will go uh, to, that finishes the lightning round. Gentlemen, you did very good. Thank you, gentlemen. One last round of applause for our thought-provoking panelists, Alan, David, Mark, and Rick, and our moderator, Tom Korfman. And please join me in thanking our sponsors one last time for making this morning possible. All scripts, Comcast Business Services, Drink or Biddle, as well as our presenting sponsor, Price Waterhouse Coopers. If you found this morning's program insightful and informative, as I certainly have, then you'll probably want to mark your calendar for our next healthcare event. That will be our Cranes Hospital Trustee Breakfast. This will happen on February 28th at the Four Seasons Hotel. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful holiday. Thank you for coming. <laughs>